It's Christmas Day, 1994. Hacker Kevin Mitnick exits a movie theater in downtown Denver. He pulls his coat tight and hunches his shoulders. He's not used to this cold weather. It's been two years since Mitnick fled Los Angeles after learning there was a warrant out for his arrest. He's been living in various parts of the country under false identities ever since. As he walks back to his car, he limps on his right foot, the result of the pebble he keeps in his shoe to change his gait. It's part of a host of steps he's taken to alter his appearance. He's also switched from glasses to contacts, cut his hair, and lost over 100 pounds. He looks far different than the photo on his FBI wanted poster. The streets are deserted. Most people are celebrating the holiday at home with their families. Bored, Mitnick pulls a clone cell phone out of his pocket and calls a hacker friend he met on the internet. Hello? Hey, it's Eric. Mitnick has been living under the name Eric Weiss, Harry Houdini's real name. I just got out of a movie, or as I like to call it, celebrating Jewish Christmas. And I thought I'd give you a shout His friend chuckles. (laughs) And a happy Jewish Christmas to you, too. Actually, I think I have a Christmas present you might be very interested in. Oh, yeah? I got into Ariel tonight. Mitnick stops in his tracks. Ariel is a server hosted by the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Mitnick has reason to believe that it hosts a source code for a popular cell phone. To evade the authorities, Mitnick needs cell phones, and lots of them. Source codes are his key to cloning them so he's desperate to hack into Ariel. He presses his current phone closer to his ear. Are you serious? As a heart attack, I can give you the port number where I set up the back door, but you know whose server this is, right? Yeah, yeah, Shimomura's. Mitnick spits out the name with contempt. Sutumo Shimomura is a well-known cybersecurity expert who undoubtedly has extensive security protocols in place. He's also what's known as a white hat hacker, Someone who uses his hacking skills to fix security bugs, not exploit them. I'm not worried about him. I'll take all my usual precautions. All right, as long as you know what you're getting yourself into. It'll be fine. Besides, that guy deserves to be taken down a notch, the arrogant jerk. Mitnick walks quickly back to his car. It'll take 20 minutes for him to drive back to the hotel where he's been crashing. That already feels like an eternity. He wants to be logging into Ariel right this second. He can't wait to get his hands on that cell phone source code. And if he gets to embarrass one of the world's foremost white hat hackers in the process, that's just an added bonus. How does this sound? Over 290 channels, 80,000 on-demand titles, and the ability to record up to 16 shows at once, plus a reliable TV provider that has all your favorite shows? Pretty good, right? If you want all that, look no further than Dish TV. Dish's setup is also integrated with Netflix, Amazon Prime, and YouTube, plus a free voice remote and DVR is included with your Dish service. Dish has also been ranked number one in customer satisfaction by J.D. Power for three straight years. If you're interested in Dish TV, visit dish.com. That's dish.com. Dish, tuned in to you. Where's my order? Where's my order? Where's my order? Break free from customer support monotony. Welcome to Intercom for customer support, the business messenger that uses chatbots, shared inboxes, apps, and more. Intercom's business messenger resolves questions that can be answered automatically, so customer support feels less like Groundhog Day and more like help is on the way. Go to intercom.com slash support to learn more about Intercom's business messenger for customer support. From Wondery, I'm Stephen Johnson, and this is American Innovations. On our last episode, Kevin Mitnick turned from teenage phone freak into one of the earliest and most notorious computer hackers. His activities got him arrested multiple times. But by 1992, threatened with arrest again, he decided to go on the run. His sudden disappearance made him the most wanted cyber criminal in the country. 
a hacker so dangerous he was allegedly capable of starting a nuclear war with a single phone call. The hunt to bring in Mitnick will pit hacker versus hacker. And for the first time in his life, Mitnick may have finally met his match. This is the third and final episode in our series, White Hat versus Black Hat. It's Christmas evening, 1994. Tsutomu Shimomura is driving from San Francisco to Lake Tahoe for a ski trip. 30 years old, with black hair past his shoulders, Shimomura looks the part of a laid-back California dude. Two years ago, he testified in front of the United States Congress, wearing ripped jeans and sandals. But Shimomura is also a brilliant computational physicist, a researcher at the University of California, San Diego Supercomputer Center, and a cybersecurity expert who has consulted for the NSA, the Air Force, and the FBI. Ugh. Shimomura has been looking forward to this trip for months. The last thing he wants is to think about work. But when he checks the caller ID, his face falls. It's Andrew Gross, the graduate student he pays to monitor his computer system. What is it? I think there's a problem. Yes, I deduced that from the fact that you're calling on Christmas. Spit it out. The log files are shrinking. Damn it. All right, uh, how soon can you get to the lab? Shimomura's ski trip will have to wait. Log files aren't supposed to shrink. They're a record of everything done within an operating system. If someone is going in and actively deleting them, that someone is usually a hacker trying to cover his tracks. Shimomura had thought he made his computer systems impenetrable. He needs to figure out how someone has gotten in ASAP. Within a few hours, he's on a plane to San Diego, to the Supercomputer Center. Later that night, past three in the morning, Shimomura and Gross sit in front of a terminal, poring over their security protocols, trying to figure out how the intruder got in. Shimomura pushes his chair back and runs his hands through his hair. They must have spoofed the IP, and I just don't see another way. Shimomura has programmed his computers to only talk to other computers that are designated as trusted. These trusted machines are identified by what's known as an Internet Protocol Address, or IP. Somehow the intruder gained access by faking a trusted IP. Gross shakes his head. And I know people have been talking about that as a way to break into secure networks, but I didn't know anyone had done it for real. I wasn't even sure it could be done, frankly. It's tough, but apparently it's possible. It's a pretty ballsy move, though. Do you think it was who I think it was? You mean Mitnick? (laughs) Please. Mitnick doesn't have the skills to pull this off. That guy is nothing but a password-stealing con artist. Shimomura considers Mitnick a pest with no real programming skills. Sure, he's gotten into computers owned by the FBI, the DMV, and the military, but he did it with words, not code. He's a master of what hackers call social engineering, tricking and manipulating unsuspecting employees into giving him passwords and other confidential information. But from a technical standpoint, as far as Shimomura is concerned, Mitnick is nothing special. Ever since he went underground, everyone thinks he's responsible for every hack. He's like the boogeyman. Gross shrugs. He could have gotten help. I mean, this seems like the kind of break-in he would do. Whoever it is just copied a bunch of stuff and didn't do any damage. Isn't that his M.O.? I suppose it's possible. Let's finish securing these computers and then I'm headed back to Tahoe. Whoever this jerk is, he already cost me one day of skiing. I'm not letting him take any more. That whole week on the slopes, Shimomura has a hard time enjoying himself. The Christmas Day hack left a bad taste in his mouth a taste he won't be able to get rid of until he catches whoever was behind it. Finally, a month later, he gets a lead. This is Satumo. Satumo, Bruce Cobal here. Cobal is the organizer of an annual conference called Computers, Freedom, and Privacy. He and Shimomoro travel in the same circles, but they don't speak regularly. Hey, sorry to bother you at work, but I got a very strange email the other day, and it turned out it pertained to you. Okay... I have an account on The Well, you know, the internet service provider. I know what The Well is. Of course. Sorry. Anyway, I got an email from them that my storage space was taking up too much room, and I needed to clear it out. This was news to me because I've barely ever used it. But when I went into the account, there were 158 megabytes worth of files, all belonging to you. Shimomura sits up straighter in his chair. What files? 
Cobol reads him a list of file names. Yeah, those were all stolen from my computer over Christmas. As soon as I realized someone had gotten into my account, I told the well that someone was breaking in. They've been able to monitor what he's been up to. He comes on pretty regularly and stashes files in accounts that are inactive. Whoever it is doesn't know that the well is on to him. So there's a chance to catch him. Exactly. But they want to move fast. This hacker hasn't done any damage yet, but he could bring down the entire service if he wanted to. I'm coming up there. It's 7 o'clock in the evening, February 5th, 1995. Shimomura, Andrew Gross, and Bruce Cobol are jammed into a small office in the back of the Wells headquarters. Over the past couple days, observing the intruder, they've learned that he usually logs on in the evening. They're waiting for him to make his nightly appearance. Shimomura pops a potato chip into his mouth. I know I had my doubts, but I really am starting to think it's Midnick. Gross nods. I agree. In any case, this is not some run-of-the-mill hacker poking around. The intruder has been using the well as a springboard, breaking into a wide variety of computers belonging to some major companies, including Motorola, Apple, and others. Gross smiles giddily. We could bring down Midnick. I mean, that would be huge. We'd be heroes. Shimomura shrugs. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We don't have proof yet. Hopefully, after tonight, we will. The team has installed a program that will capture every keystroke their intruder types. It's sure to give them even more information about the trespasser's identity. Kobol looks up from the monitor. Hey, he's logged on. Here we go. Shimomura and Gross lean over Kobol's shoulders, peering at the monitor. Kobol runs his hand through his hair. Okay, he's sticking to his routine. He's copying a file over. Aha, now he's into John Markov's emails. Markov is a technology reporter for the New York Times, who has followed Mitnick's case closely, even co-authoring a book about him. They've noticed that the intruder regularly reads the emails of roughly a dozen people. Shimomura points at the monitor. He's running a search. What's he looking for? They all stare at the screen as the intruder's keystrokes appear. Koble reads them as they pop up, one by one. I-T-N-I. What does that mean? Gross elbows Shimomura and raises his eyebrows at him. They know. Shimomura leans closer to the screen. I-T-N-I. That's a string of letters from the name Mitnick. That's Mitnick running a search, seeing who's talking about him. Gross rocks back and forth on his heels. Giddy. It has to be. A smile spreads slowly over Shimomura's face. And we're going to take him down. We get support from Peloton. Imagine never getting bored with your workouts. Always having something new and exciting to look forward to. World-class instructors, curated music, and endless fitness variety. That is what you get with Peloton. For my money, the folks at Peloton have created an unmatched fitness experience that's going to keep you motivated workout after workout. Whether you're looking for some extra encouragement, structured workouts, or you're just in the mood to laugh, their instructors are there to bring out your best during each class. In fact, they're so great that everyone I know who's worked out with Peloton has their favorite instructors, including me. Plus, With an endless variety of live and on-demand cycling classes and live and on-demand strength, yoga, and stretching classes off the bike, you'll keep coming back for more. Add a strength class to your ride or combine cardio and strength in one workout with Bike Boot Camp to get a total body fitness experience. And no matter where you're starting from, Peloton's got you covered, from beginner programs to advanced classes. Get started on your Peloton journey. Go to OnePeloton.com to learn more. That's O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. When you're innovating, you've got to question everything. The folks at Hyundai did, and they've completely reimagined every inch of the all-new Tucson, resulting in an SUV loaded with available innovations both inside and out. LED daytime running lights are stylishly hidden within the front grille, making them invisible when they're not in use. You'll be blown away by the 10 and a quarter inch infotainment screen or the digital key technology, which allows you to use your smartphone as a spare key. Test drive the 2022 Hyundai Tucson at your nearest Hyundai dealer or learn more at HyundaiUSA.com. Call 562 314 
4603 for complete details. It's Saturday, February 11th, 1995, San Jose, California. Andrew Gross walks into a conference room in the headquarters of Netcom, another internet service provider. He's pushing a dolly full of file boxes. The records are here. The team has figured out that Mitnick's been using Netcom's internet service to break into the well. With the help of the district attorney, they've subpoenaed Netcom's phone records. Shimomura, Gross, and Cobal spread out the records on a conference table. Then Shimomura walks over to a whiteboard and writes a series of dates and times on the board. So based on our observations on the well, these are the dates and times we know that Mitnick logged on to Netcom's servers. In 1995, most home computers used dial-up modems to get online. Netcom has local dial-in sites around the country for people to connect to their service and not pay long-distance rates. If Shimomura and his team can identify a dial-in site that corresponds with all of the times they know Mitnick was logged in, they'll know which city he's operating from. So everybody pick three dates and go through these records and see which dial-in numbers show up for all of them. The team gets to work going through the phone records, pages and pages of incoming call data. Netcom has approximately 400,000 users. Even though they know the dates and times Mitnick was active, it's still like looking for a needle in a haystack. (sighs) Several hours later, the room is littered with empty coffee cups and half-eaten slices of pizza. Gross is the last one working. His eyes are swimming as he reads number after number after number. Shimamora stretches in the corner, touching his toes. Cobal slumps in his chair, catching a catnap. Gross throws down his highlighter triumphantly. Done! Shimomura crosses to the whiteboard. Okay, what repeated dial-in locations did you have? We'll look for overlaps between all of us. After comparing notes, they narrow it down to two cities, Austin, Texas, and Raleigh, North Carolina. But they can't narrow their results any further. Gross tosses back the last of his coffee and lets out a heavy sigh. Ah, now what? I mean, it can't be in two places at once. Shimomura thinks for a moment. There has to be a way to figure out which city Mitnick is in. He picks up the records and studies them one more time. He wrinkles his brow. Cobalt immediately clocks it. What? What do you notice? Shimomura doesn't answer him, just stretches out his hand. Let me see your set of records. Cobalt scrambles to hand over the pages. Shimomura skims through those records, tapping his finger and nodding his head as he works. Gross and Cobalt exchange an impatient look. They know he's onto something, but what? Finally, Shimomura gets up and underlines one city name on the whiteboard. He's in Raleigh. Gross and Cobol look at him, waiting for him to say more. You're sure? Positive. The calls to the Raleigh Center came from a modem hooked up to a cell phone. The calls to Austin were from a landline. We know from the information he's stealing that Mitnick is very focused on cell phone source code. I mean, he's been cloning cell phones. It's actually a good way to disguise his location. It's smart. Cobal shrugs. Well, I'm convinced. Andrew? Gross nods. Yeah, but now what? Raleigh's not a small city. How do we find him? Well, the records indicate that it's a Sprint cell phone. We can call the FBI and get a warrant to get Sprint to tell us which cell phone towers the signal is bouncing off of. That will get us pretty close to him. Gross sighs. Getting a warrant could take days, though. He could be on the move by then. True. They're silent for a moment. Then Shimomoro looks up. Or we could do it the Kevin Mitnick way. Kobol and Gross smile. They don't know exactly what Shimomoro has in mind, but they like the sound of it. Later that night, Shimomoro leans back in his chair, feet propped up on the conference table, phone resting in the crook of his neck as he listens to hold music. Gross and Kobol sit across from him, playing hangman while they wait. Sprint technical support. This is Jim Murphy speaking. Shimomura sits up straight and switches the call to speaker so Gross and Cobol can hear. It's time to put his own social engineering skills to the test. Oh, Mr. Murphy, my name is Sutumu Shimomura. I'm a computer security expert. I've worked with the FBI and other governmental agencies. I'm currently on the trail of Kevin Mitnick. Do you know who that is? Uh, that name sounds familiar. He's a wanted criminal. He has a 15-year history of tampering with phones and computers. We have reason to believe that he is using a Sprint cell phone to pull off his latest antics. And I need you to help me get him. Do you have a warrant? 
Not exactly. Well, I'd really like to help you, but without a warrant, I'm pretty limited in what I can tell you. Well, can you at least tell me this? How far back does your data go? Uh, I can go back a few days, uh, as far as Thursday the 9th, uh, 3 p.m. Okay, great. Now, if I ask you if you have a call to a specific number at a specific time for a known duration, can you tell me if you have a record of that call? I can do that, but I can't give you the actual number that made the call without a warrant. That's fine. I don't need the number. I just need to know where in the city the signal is coming from. Can you tell me that? Murphy is silent on the other end of the phone. The silence stretches for longer and longer. Cobol and Gross look to Shimamura anxiously. He holds up his hand to them, as if to say, have patience. Finally, Yeah, that's okay. I can do that. Okay, great. So let's get started. On Friday at 3.29 p.m., do you see a call to 919-555-7332 that lasts approximately 44 minutes? Yes, I have it. I uh, came through Tower 19. Shimomura flashes a thumbs up to Gross and Kobol. Okay, great. Uh, still Friday. Do you have a call at 8.22 p.m. lasting 49 minutes to 910-555-6400? Yes, I have that. Uh, also off Tower 19. And is it from the same number as the first call I asked about? Uh... I'm not asking for that number, just if both calls are from the same number. Yes. Shimomura pumps his fist. Across the table, Gross and Cobol quietly high-five each other. Shimomura asks about five more calls. Murphy confirms that all of them are from the same number, all of them hitting off Tower 19. Shimomura is surprised that they're all coming from one tower. He assumed that Mitnick was changing locations, but this will make finding him even easier. Okay, one more question. Where's Tower 19? Uh, hang on a second. Um, just need to check our map here. It's located on the northeastern outskirts of the city, uh, near the airport. Can you give me an exact address? After a few more questions, Shimamura has all the information he needs to take his pursuit of Mitnick to the next level. Thank you, Murph. I owe you one. He hangs up the phone and turns to Gross and Cobol. Time to bring in the FBI. I'm flying out to Raleigh tomorrow. You two keep monitoring Mitnick. If there's any indication that he knows we're on to him, let me know. We don't want him going underground again. It's after one in the morning when Shimamura walks out of the conference room, but he's wide awake. Soon, he's going to bring in Kevin Mitnick. The moment he steps off the plane in Raleigh the following evening, Shimamura is on the phone with the FBI, arranging for them to send a radio surveillance team and their lead cybercrime agent down from D.C. But when Shimamura reaches his hotel, he's greeted by an urgent message from Gross. He's on to us. Shimamura sits on the bed. It's been a long day. How do you know? Instead of covering his tracks, he changed passwords, including for the root account. I think he's scorching the earth, getting ready to go on the run again. Shimamura rubs his head. He's done everything he can by himself to narrow down where Mitnick is. But to go the final distance, he needs the FBI and their equipment. He just needs Mitnick to feel safe for another 24 to 48 hours. But it might already be too late. Recent data shows that out of all the female-owned businesses, it is estimated that one in three is owned by a mom. Ever wondered how these amazing moms and dads find time to hire for their businesses while juggling their families? With ZipRecruiter. That's how. And right now, you can try it for free, only at ZipRecruiter.com AI. CEO and founder Talia Goldstein is one such mompreneur. Besides being the mother of two, her personalized matchmaking company, 3-Day Rule, is constantly growing, and she needs to hire several matchmakers a month. So she uses ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter's powerful technology helps her find people with the right experience and actively invites them to apply. But Talia is not the only employer who loves ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. Remember, this special offer is only good at ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. It's February 14th, 1995, Raleigh, North Carolina. Inside his small, Spartan apartment, Kevin Mitnick sits at his computer, 
making some last minute preparations before he ditches this location and goes back on the run. For the past week, he's had an uneasy feeling. Little things have added up. Signs that someone has logged into one of his accounts. Backdoor access to various computers no longer working. He'd rather be safe than sorry, so it's time to move on. Tonight, he's performing one final task, copying over all the files he's been storing on the well to another location. Mitnick looks up. Does he hear something? His stomach sinks. That general sense of unease is now full-on anxiety. Who is it? FBI, open up. Who are you looking for? Kevin Mitnick. We have a warrant. Mitnick springs into action. He shuts down his computer and unplugs it. No, you, you have the wrong apartment. Go check the mailboxes. You'll see. He looks around for possible hiding places for his cell phones, silently cursing himself for not preparing better for this moment. He buries one cell phone deep in his gym bag and shoves the other one under his mattress. Open the door now. If you don't, we'll kick it in. Mitnick looks towards the balcony. Could he jump? No, he'd break a leg in the fall, or worse. He doesn't have time to tie the sheets together and climb down. He's out of options. Mitnick slowly opens the door, and a team of agents swarm in. One shoves the warrant in his face, while the other starts searching. All right, let's see your ID. Mitnick shows him a license for his current alias. See, I'm telling you, you you have the wrong guy. An agent comes out of the bedroom, holding up the cell phone Mitnick stashed under the mattress. Meanwhile, another one has dumped the contents of his gym bag on the floor, revealing the second cell phone. Two cell phones, huh? At the time, cell phone calls cost roughly a dollar per minute. Owning two is suspicious. It's not a crime. Another agent comes out, holding up a wallet. Well, well, what do we have here? He pulls out one ID after another. Who's Eric Weiss? Who's Michael Stanfill? Mitnick shrugs. You said you're here for Kevin Mitnick. His name's not on any of those IDs. Okay, Mr. Midnick, have it your way. While Midnick sits on his couch and waits, the FBI ransacks his apartment. Finally, after three hours, a smiling agent hands over a small slip of paper to his boss. I found this in the inner pocket of an old ski jacket. The lead agent studies the paper, then holds it up for Midnick to see. Look familiar? It's a pay stub for a job Midnick worked years ago under his own name shoved into the pocket of a jacket and forgotten about. The agent takes out his handcuffs. It's over, Kevin. It's nine in the morning, February 15th, 1995. Kevin Mitnick is escorted into a North Carolina courtroom in a belly chain, handcuffs, and leg shackles, still wearing the same black sweatpants he was arrested in the day before. The courtroom is packed with reporters. Mitnick takes his seat in a daze. As he looks around the courtroom, his eyes land on a slight Japanese-American man with long black hair who's glaring at him. Mitnick's never met him before, but he knows exactly who it is. Tsutomu Shimomura. Mitnick hangs his head back, looking up. So that's how they got me. He gives a small smile. At least it took another hacker to bring him down. Mitnick is accused of stealing $80 million worth of software. He and his defense attorneys argue that copying isn't stealing and that he didn't do any damage to the computers he broke into. But the judge doesn't buy it. He sentences Mitnick to five years in prison. And while Mitnick is serving his time, the world changes yet again. Call now for America Online, a new way to use your computer to communicate, have fun, and get instant news and information. You've got mail. By 1999, America Online, the leading internet provider in the country, has 18 million subscribers. The most popular websites, like Yahoo, claim more than 100 million visitors per month. Computers are no longer the province of the geeks and the hobbyists. They're a way of life. E-commerce explodes. And as the years pass, the internet becomes even more deeply intertwined with the global economy. Hackers can now do much more than just steal software and credit card numbers. They can bring the stock market to its knees. They can be soldiers in state-sponsored cyber warfare. Companies and governments sell the public on being able to safely store and share sensitive information online. They can't tolerate hackers. But the security they offer comes from knowing what holes in the system need to be patched and which backdoors need to be barricaded. And that information, ironically, comes from hackers and their relentless quest to poke the weak spots. Over the next 20 years, the internet spreads into every corner of daily life, 
and hacking becomes increasingly professionalized on both sides of the law. For veteran hackers like Kevin Mitnick, this creates all sorts of new opportunities. It's winter 2014. Kevin Mitnick, now 51, strides through the busy first floor of a high-end Manhattan department store. Dressed in a blue uniform for SeaTac security, he weaves past artfully decorated mannequins and salesmen spraying cologne. He heads straight for a door in the back corner marked employees only. He knocks and adjusts the baseball cap on his head. A woman in a power suit opens the door. Mitnick gives her his most winning smile. Hi, I'm here from SeaTac Security. Uh, we need to make some adjustments to the motion sensors. He hands her a business card. The woman frowns. I don't have you on the schedule. I got a dispatch order this morning. It said someone named Lisa authorized it. Well, if Lisa authorized it, come on in. Thanks. This shouldn't take long, and then I'll be out of your hair. The alarm panel's in the wiring closet, straight through to the back. Thanks. Mitnick scans the office as he walks through, past workers busily typing away and answering phones. He's on the lookout for vulnerabilities. People are a lot more aware of computer security in 2015 than they were in the 1980s, but there are still plenty of lapses. This is especially true of the latest generation of so-called smart appliances, printers, TVs, security cameras, even refrigerators that are connected to the internet. People frequently forget to change the default passwords on these devices, giving would-be intruders access to all the computers on their network. Mitnick spies a printer in the corner. Bingo. He pulls out his smartphone and tries to connect wirelessly to the printer. When it asks for a password, he enters the default password he's memorized for that manufacturer. The phone connects. Mitnick smiles. After pretending to work for a few minutes in the wiring closet, Mitnick strides out, waving at the woman who let him in. All set. The next day, in his hotel room, Mitnick smiles when he sees the caller ID on his cell phone. It's the chief technology officer for the retailer he just broke into. Lisa, I trust you found my report. I did. Very clever, putting it directly on my computer desktop. Well, it's safer than email. I figured you didn't want a document like that floating around the internet, particularly since it outlines every one of your company's security vulnerabilities. Since he got out of prison, Mitnick has traded his black hat for a white one. He runs a security company where businesses hire him to hack into their systems to expose the weak points. Companies he's been paid to hack into include FedEx, IBM, Lockheed Martin, and one of the major credit bureaus. Can I ask you a question? Why didn't you just do this in the first place? Why'd you become a thief? Well, I object to the word thief. I copied software. I didn't steal it. And I never financially gained from any of the hacks I did. But it was still wrong what you did. Sure, we broke rules. But by breaking those rules, we discovered things. I mean, look at Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. They used to be obsessed with blue boxes, the gadget that early hackers used to control the phone system. Jobs once said that without blue boxes, there would be no Apple. And if I'd never been on the FBI's most wanted list, you probably wouldn't be hiring me as your security expert. Yeah, I can't argue with that. Mitnick's company is still in business today. He claims to have a 100% success rate, meaning that he's been able to gain access to every system he's ever been hired to test, a statistic he's proud of citing in his many media appearances. Yeah, 100% we get in, and that's probably because the hackers are ahead of the security industry. Kevin Mitnick may have traded in his black hat for a white one. But as today's hackers continue to get more sophisticated in their attacks, it raises the question of how secure our digital lives can ever truly be. From Wondery, this is episode three of Hacking on American Innovations. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review. And be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. And to listen to episodes one week early, join Wondery Plus. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can help support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey. And tell us which innovation stories you'd like to hear. A quick note about the recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations. But they're based on historical research. American Innovations is hosted by me, Stephen Johnson. 
For more information on my books and TV series about science and innovation, including my latest one, Extra Life, A Short History of Living Longer, which is out now as a book and appearing on PBS in the next few weeks, you can visit my website at stephenberlinjohnson.com or you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen B. Johnson. Sound design on this episode is by Jason Freeman. This episode was written by Austin Rackless with editing by Matt Almos. Produced by Andy Herman and Natalie Shishaw. Executive produced by Jenny Lauer Beckman, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. In 2017, plumes of vape clouds surrounded schools across America and teen vaping rates skyrocketed. As more and more children became addicted to e-cigarettes, parents, politicians, and health experts looked for answers. All eyes turned to a company at the heart of this new epidemic, a Silicon Valley startup named Juul. Their pitch-perfect marketing campaign, high levels of nicotine, and social media influencer endorsements attracted users of all ages. Within a year, millions of teenagers were addicted. Was this an accident, or did ambition blind them to the unintended consequences of what they created? From the team behind Dr. Death and Bad Batch comes The Vaping Fix. Listen to The Vaping Fix on Apple Podcasts or Amazon Music, You can also listen early and ad-free by starting your free trial of Wondery Plus in the Wondery app.